Welcome back, Robbie. We are live. Welcome, everybody. Before we introduce our special guest to start off 2022 with a big bang and a and some exciting topics to do with photography. I just want to welcome everybody. Hope you all had a good Christmas, good New Year's. And John and I are back every Wednesday. We're going to be continuing with these live streams. At We're changing our time to noon instead of 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time uh, or Eastern Standard Time, whatever it may be. So I just want to remind everybody that um, the replays are available in the YouTube channel. There's a lot of good stuff in there, man. We We've been doing these for almost a year now. We've got a lot of really good interviews, and we like having these interviews with photographers who are uh, doing all kinds of fun stuff in the industry. So having said that, uh, I want to welcome everybody. I want to welcome our special guest. I'm going to let John introduce him. I want to let everybody know you can ask questions. Put them into the comments section. Fire away your questions. As you can see on the screen, we've got uh, the one and only Sal Sincoto. So I'm going to let John introduce him. Let's go from there. No no worries. Uh of course, I'm sure a lot of people know Sal. I've been a follower of hers for probably many, many years. Um, Good-looking guy. I love the haircut. That's awesome. <laughs> but, of course, uh, just a little brief history, and I already ran this through you, so you said it was most of it. Your company is called Salvatore Sincotta Photography, um, and you have, of course, salsincotta.com. Um, you're based out of Illinois, from what we were talking about, but you do shoot all over the world. We know that weddings, senior photography, uh, portrait work, amazing stuff. But before photography, and we'll get into a lot of your history too with Rob and that, but I know before you were an IT worker, you worked in the IT field, uh, companies like Microsoft and Procter and Gamble. Um, one thing that I like is you're a Canon Explorer of Light because Rob is a, an ex Nikon slash Sony user now, so and I'm the Ooh. Canon guy, so. <laughs> so be Canon tough Explorer of Light, now. yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> of course, uh, and with Profoto, you've been named, of course, a legend of light. So you do a lot of stuff with Profoto, which is amazing. Um, the things I like, of course, is uh, you're the writer, one of the writers, authors, educator, and of course, you're the publisher and owner of shutter magazine which i love i get the newsletter every month and i go and look at the books and stuff um and of course it was physical too but we can get into that later of what happened with that and of course what i used to like when i was a wedding photographer i've been out for a couple years now as wedding photographer but when i was uh of course you get really busy and you don't always have time to do your stuff so what do you do you outsource it and why not go to the best place you can and send it out to evolve edits which you are of course founder and owner of and uh, we can get into there i loved your wasn't i think it was the second level of edits i think it's premiere or something i can't remember but uh, i used to do a lot of those so um but yeah with no further ado we have mr sal sincata thanks for being here well, thank you so much for that awesome introduction. I, I like that. If you guys introduce me like that all the time, I'll, I'll be on any podcast you ever have. <laughs> well, we're He's on committed. like 50 or 60 something now, so <laughs> Rob would know the totals. So, um, yeah. but, All right. Uh, so, yeah, Rob, so, so, Sal, I want to ask you, uh, I, I always like to start off by asking the question, like, what got you into photography? There's a lot of information in the intro as far as your, uh, your history is concerned. So I know you, you went to, I'm really curious. You went to Binghamton University, which is in New York, I believe. And can yes. you tell us what you took there? And just a really quick preview. What got you into photography? Sort of like just a snapshot view before we get deeper into some of the other topics. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. And, you know, John, as he's reading, you know, kind of the intro and where we're at and things we've accomplished, as we sit here in 2022, I realize that I've been a professional photographer for 15 years now. And you start, I think as you get older, you start looking back and, and you're like, holy shit, look what we've accomplished over this period of time. So it's, it's quite amazing to hear somebody else rattle that stuff off because as an entrepreneur, business owner, I'm always looking forward. I very rarely stop to, to look back. So that's really cool to, to hear all that stuff. But yes, uh, I went to, I shot my first wedding at around uh, 17 years old and uh, hated every minute of it, by the way. So it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, to think about that. I'm a wedding photographer now, but back then in the eighties, if I date myself, wedding photography is very stiff, uh, right? Traditional. We were shooting film, of course. And uh, it just, I didn't enjoy it. Uh, and so my family, I'm a immigrant family. My, uh, my father's side is Italian, hence the name Salvatore Sincata. Uh, my mother's side is Lebanese. So we're half Middle Eastern, half Italian and we're immigrants. And so I was the first to graduate college. And at that time, my family was like, no, you're not going to be an artist. 
you're going to school, you're going to be a, a lawyer, you're going to be, so that, that was kind of the, the direction they were pushing not to be a broke photographer, right, is what they would think of it. But all the while, my aunt had a uh, dark room in the basement. And so at a very young age, I was exposed to photography and absolutely fell in love with it. It just never, it was never presented as a career. So I go off to corporate, graduate from college, graduate from business school. Uh, Binghamton's a top uh, business university in the, in, the, in the country. Get recruited by Procter & Gamble, work in IT. Turns out I have a knack for the more technical side. Um, and uh, from there, I'm always doing photography on the side. And one day, about 15 years ago, I, I said, I've had enough. I've got to follow my dreams. I got to do what I love. Life's too short. Tired of working for somebody else. If I'm going to work, like this, I'm going to do it for myself. I'm going to fail for myself, and I'm going to succeed for myself. And Salvatore Sincata Photography was born. Wow. That's amazing. So it sounds to me like you really had the drive, the ambition, the original. If you could go way back to when you were a teenager or in your early 20s, you probably had the, a lot of uh, drive to be an artist of sorts. And you did the uh, university thing to sort of appease your parents and the cultural pressures that were coming from them or... Yep. Family pressures. Is that correct to a large That's 100% degree? 100% accurate. Yeah. Cool, cool. But no regrets, right? No, no regrets. I think, you know, I think anybody in life, I know we're talking photography, but I think when you look back at wherever you are in your life right now, mm -hmm. I have found, at least in being reflective, that it's a culmination of every step you took along the way. So while, yeah, I went to college, I got a tech, you know, degree in business. I had a degree in finance and computer science. Wow. And ev every step of the way, wow. being an entrepreneur today, I need that tech background. I need that uh -huh. finance background. So uh -huh. it's, it's allowed me to be a successful entrepreneur. So definitely no regrets. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Well, I guess that lesbian dance theory degree I got is not going to do me much good. <laughs> Rob, it just I'm depends on where you want to go with it, man. Yeah, it depends where you want to go. No, yeah, you're, so you're talking about something that Steve Jobs has brought up uh, back when he was around. He said, you know, you got to connect the dots and look back at your life. And uh, that's a pretty deep topic. So, but that leads me to the next question I want to ask you is, is that you could have easily gone and stayed in IT and or finance and gone down to corporate. You could have been like working for some corporation. And instead, you broke away and followed your dreams. And you like, okay, by the way, you've been at this 15 years. I, I listen to that. I think the guy is a newbie. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but shut up, man. You got a 40 employees and you're massive. So there's a big part of me that just wants to throw away my camera and go get a real job. I'm like, how the hell did he do this? And was it, did you think waiting, waiting? I, I got to ask, like, how old are you now, roughly? 51. Okay. So you look awesome, by the way. I was like, is he 38? Or, oh, I love you, Rob. He looks amazing. So, so, but you really got into it later in life. So, but all the culmination of what you had done prior to, I'm going to guess that probably contributed to the momentum, that wheel that started spinning, that really made everything happen for you within 15 years. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, there's no doubt the the acceleration path. When, when I look back at mm -hmm. what we've done and the period of time we've done it in, uh, it's nothing short of amazing. And I and it's not something I pat myself on the back about. It's it's more a testament to the people I've surrounded myself with, the okay. vision I have. Uh, but most importantly, I would say there's a lot of creative people in the world, a lot of big ideas. But where most people fail is they get lazy on the execution <laughs> side. Right? So there's a lot of smart people with a lot of big ideas, but they get yeah. lazy. I would say maybe I don't have all the best ideas, uh, but what ideas we do have, we mm -hmm. execute on uh, quickly. And that, I would say, is a strength of ours for sure. That is golden, man. I mean, it's like we could shut this off right now and we say, everybody, go and take that. I mean, this is gold, absolutely gold. I love it. So, but why don't most people do it? You said the word lazy, and, and yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, it's, uh, let, me, uh, let me expand on that, too. Sure. A lot of people recently, they'll ask me, like, hey, when you started this 15 years ago, was this your, was this your dream? Is this where you thought you were going to be? And the answer is no. Um, I would say, again, today, I'm where I'm at, whether it's the publisher of a magazine, having a photo. I mean, we have a photography conference called Shutterfest with over 2,500 photographers from around the world that come to St. Louis. 
I didn't get into photography for that. I got into photography because I love the craft. But then opportunity presents itself. And this isn't just unique to photography. This is unique to everything in our lives. An opportunity presents itself. There's a door there. And people go one of two ways. Fear takes over. It's not laziness in that moment. Fear takes over. And they don't want to step through that door of opportunity. Or you're like me. And I'm too stupid to know that I should be afraid. And I just step through that door. I'm like, fuck it. I can do it. Uh, and I step through that door. And then when you get through that door, you're like, oh, shit, right? Now we got to figure this out. And that is where I've, you, having good people around you, supportive people around you are going to make you like, okay, yeah, this is a big task that lies in front of you, whatever it is, but we got this, right? Sometimes it's just a little bit of like somebody behind you just, you know, patting you on the back or nudging you forward versus the opposite, right? Like ha we've all had negative people in our lives where they're, they're going, you can't do that. Oh, you got to cut those people out of your lives, man. I mean, they will, if you're an entrepreneur, we're not talking photography, we're talking just being successful in life. If you're surrounded with negative people, how can you ever accomplish anything positive? There's always this negative energy working against you. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. I absolutely love it. So you can say that a large part of what was the fuel, the momentum that drove all of this forward and made it happen was picking and being around the right people. Yeah. Right. Without a doubt, huge part of success. I like what you said when you said um, you were too stupid. I've always said the same thing, but the way I used to say it was I had more balls than brains. I just <laughs> went ahead and did it. Mm -hmm. It's and the same thing. I agree. You just figure it out. And uh, it was like a math teacher once said, "Stop! if you have a problem, stop trying to think about it all the time. Just do something. Start acting right. on it. And that'll open up the doors. So can we, I want to ask you a question about your wife and your employees, but can we do a quick pan of your studio? Because yeah. it's right behind you. That would be awesome. And, and where so, are you right so, now? Yeah, I'm at my, my desk. And just so everybody knows who's watching, we have a uh, 12,000 square foot studio, multiple floors. Uh, so this is kind of the admin floor. My graphic designers are up here. My wife is up here. Uh, and so this is uh, more the creative floor, but it's an old historical building. It's over 100 years old and we restored it. Uh, so this is pretty cool. So tilt that back. So you can see just kind of glass whiteboards. Um, there's a full kitchen back there. Uh, and then even behind me, you know, a lot of people don't realize I always talk about uh, printing and the importance of printing. I'm going to walk you right over here. So we print in studio uh, for a lot of what we do. So this is kind of right next to my desk. It's a full uh, full print area. Now, of course, we're not doing, right, we're not doing um, metals and canvas and stuff like that, but, like, we do a lot of fine art prints uh, and uh, larger kind of photo, you know, uh, maybe luster prints and stuff like that for our clients. So uh, I, I love our craft. I love what we do, and I, and I think we've got the coolest jobs in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Reminds me yeah. of uh, Maggie's studio because Maggie does a lot of her own printing, too, and she actually prints canvas on the spot, too. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how she does it, but... Uh... Uh, yeah, it amazes me. And I've been at this for a long time. And I was just thinking about this a few months ago, how I'm like, man, I, this, I take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I get to do this and I'm just taking pictures. Sometimes but, uh, you got to pinch yourself when you, you step mm -hmm. back and you're like, Can you believe we're getting paid money for this? Like, yeah. uh, kind of a little segue. We, you know, we don't do we're, we're kind of more in the people business. And uh, recently we've been getting tagged for a ton of commercial work. Okay. And uh, like video commercials, um, food photography. So we're, we're working with a celebrity chef here in the United States. And we got tagged to do a bunch of, of uh, food work for them. And uh, one of those things, just step through that door. There's an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at it, and I'm sitting there taking these pictures, and me and my wife are there, and we're like, can, can you believe that they flew us here? We're taking <laughs> pictures of food, and then we get to eat all this amazing food that, that, that they can't do anything with. Like, we're getting paid money. Yeah. It's amazing. You're getting paid money, and you get to eat at the same time. Because, And even, like, celebrities. I know you shoot a lot of celebrities in the past. Like, I, I remember reading on, I think it was on your website or something, about how you actually shot at the White House. You used to actually shoot Obama. Yep, we've got to photograph President Obama, Michelle Obama. It, it's it's just sports celebrities. It's just it's really cool when you think yeah. about that you're yeah. creating for a living, and people are paying you money for that. Yeah.
And that all happened within the last 15 years. That's amazing. That, that really, so how did that happen to that level so efficiently and so, so fast? Can you attribute that to anything besides what we talked about? You know, was there, was it the quality of work plus your publicity, your marketing, your branding and, and your networking? Was, was there any, I love marketing. Anybody knows me knows that marketing and success principles is my thing. And I read a lot of your blog posts as part of my research to, I, I knew about you, everybody knows about you, but I was like, I went even deeper and I was like, Oh, this guy's awesome. He's awesome. He's uh, really, he's got the same philosophy, but uh, I'm going to say you're, uh, you have to excuse me. I'm borrowing my neighbor's condo down here in Costa Rica because my internet's down. So they're, they have to do a, a doctor's phone call. So they're on Skype. They're uh, no worries at all. Not Sorry distracting guys. me. Yeah. Just, so anyways, off. we're not all there for a live. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's talk. I'll organize it. You come down. We'll have Do Peter Hurley come. Down, we'll bring we'll bring pretty Peter Hurley down and Maggie and Maria and. Let's do it. Uh, Am I allowed to come down too? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm just making sure. No, no, you're automatically in there. You and I are going to organize it, John. Okay, good. Because I don't want them saying, "Oh, what happened to that part?" And they go, "Oh, the butler did it." <laughs> awesome. I know this place pretty good. I've been coming here for 20 years, and I'm well connected. But that's always been something I wanted to do. But so back to where I was, and uh, you know, you got you said you had 40 employees, and 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 I that happened. That's big. Most photographers I know, 99.999% of photographers I grew up with and came of age with were couples. And there seemed to be a lot of women now who are taking over. And that's just a natural flow of event, events in the last 20 years, especially like Maggie and Maria, et cetera, et cetera. And they're super, super successful, like hugely successful. But you seem to have ramped it up to a whole new level. So, uh, I mean, I want to talk about your wife in a minute, but let's sit on that idea for a second first to talk about how that happened. Um, back to my original question, marketing, branding, networking, doing something every day where you're getting on the phone, calling the White House. What what can you say about that? Any thoughts? Yeah, a little bit of, uh, again, time is uh, an awesome kind of mirror to look back on. You know, when I think about, was I more talented than anybody else? Was I smarter than anyone else? Uh, did I, did I have, you know, luck, was I lucky or did I have lucky breaks? I would say no to all of the above, right? I'm, I'm no, I'm no better a photographer than anybody else. I'm no harder a worker than anyone else. I'm no luckier. Uh, what, what happened was it was just a can do attitude. It's a, um, it's a can do attitude. It's hard work. And it was a, I, I know a lot of people say stuff like this but I don't believe most people who say it. We worked seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day for 10 plus years. I mean, there was no break. I can still remember being in this studio, sleeping at two, going to bed at 2 a.m., waking up at 6 a.m. the next morning and starting again. Um, now, some people might be thinking, well, what the hell were you even doing to get to that point? Well, that's marketing, right? That's your marketing. You're getting business going, but then you're not, you can't say no, right? When you're growing a business, the idea of work-life balance, if we can pause there for a second, the idea of work-life balance is probably one of the most moronic concepts I have ever heard of. I'm sorry, everybody who's watching who's like, you know, I just want more time with, I don't care what you want more of, if you want money and you want success, something has to give, there has to be sacrifice somewhere. And early on in my career, I was willing to sacrifice a lot to get to the des this destination. In the beginning, I almost went bankrupt multiple times. Uh, not because I wasn't working hard, not because I wasn't making smart decisions. It's just because this shit isn't easy. Growing a business isn't easy. Having employees that rely on you and all of a sudden, you know, we could talk about now, COVID hits. Well, what do you do? You just go upstairs and you tell your employees like, hey, sorry, guys, can't make payroll this week. Good luck paying your rent, right? So suddenly there's this pressure on you that you have to perform. And I don't know. I took it very personal, Rob. I, I, I knew my name was on the door. I knew that every job that came in or went out, every customer we didn't respond to, every job I was laid on, all of those things, I knew it was on my shoulders and it, and it motivated me, right? So I've got an athlete athlete's mindset. I wanted to win. 
Uh, and that was very early on in my career. And I ingrained it in my employees, the ones that are still with me all this time. Um, and so I don't know that I really answered your question, but I think it's just, it's hard work. Yeah. It is. No, no. That reminds me of most of the guests we've had on this show is every time we talk to them, it always comes down to to be successful as a photographer. You can't just shoot pictures. You have to be a businessman too or a businesswoman. You have to be able to do business or you won't last. It doesn't matter how good you are. You have a hobby. If you, and listen, and I'm not, listen, I'm not judging anybody. If you, mm-hmm. we, being a photographer is so cool. I think everyone should be a photographer, right? I don't see the people who have these as the enemy or like, you know, when I'm shooting a wedding and mom is mom's over my shoulder with this, taking pictures of the pictures I'm taking, I go, mom, give me that. And I grab her, I grab her phone and I take the picture for her, right? Because she's not my competitor. Um, So I think everyone should be a photographer, but not everyone should be in the business of photography. And so there's, there's a difference there, right? And that's, that's part of what I think a lot of people miss is understanding the difference between being a photographer and being in the business of photography. If you're in the business of photography, I got news for everybody. You're working 90% of the time so that you can shoot 10% of the time. A lot of people think I'm a photographer or a living. They're like, oh, every day you just get up and you walk around and you're, and you're creative. <laughs> like, oh man, you're, you're, you're in fucking la la land. That's not how things work, right? I have to market, I have to network, I have to go to vendor meetings, client meetings, I got to deal with, work with staff, I've got to set vision and, and goals and objectives for the year ahead so that I get to shoot when it's time mm-hmm. to shoot, right? So you, yeah. it's business first, photo second. And I'll, I'll just end this kind of thought with one last thing. Uh, a, a guy who I've become friends with uh, over the years, he said something to me a long time ago. He said, he goes, you know, a lot of people don't feel like you're, this was, 12 years, 10, 12 years ago. So it's different now. But he said to me, a lot of people don't feel like you're really a photographer. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? He goes, well, if you weren't making money at this, would you still be doing it? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm a fucking entrepreneur. <laughs> I got bills to pay, man. Like, so no, that's, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, an uh, on or off switch in my brain. Like, <laughs> I have to make money. Uh, so that I can buy the new lenses, the new cameras, the new mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. insert, right? <laughs> Wh- where's that money come from? Like, we got to have a job somewhere, and I'm not going to be Sal, your barista. I want to make, I want to make money. You're such a capitalist. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good oh, point. It's a good point. It. You're not doing it for the love of photography. Your money is a primary, uh, main first objective to maintain because it's what's going to create the reality, the life. And the entire uh, situation that you have going on, of which your wife plays a big role with you. By the way, we're having we're having Sal's wife on in February, February sixteenth, and Sal is kind of amazed that she agreed to do this. But uh, I'm still amazed. I could be yeah. very persuasive. We we Bye. always like we always like John, talking. You must to, have done it, man. We always like talking to the. My wife and I work together, and I've always said she's like I'm like the sail, she's like the keel, and you know together we make such an amazing team. And it's good to hear from what, what, you know, what they have to say. So uh, I got to ask you, what is the bulk of your work right now? How long have you been married and do you have any kids? Uh, no kids. I can barely take care of myself. So <laughs> a kid into the mix would not be, uh, do well. Uh, no kids. We have been married uh, one year now, but Alyssa has worked for the studio for 10 years. Okay. Um, uh, this past, I think October it was, she was 10 years. I should probably know that, uh, but she's worked <laughs> for the studio for 10 years. And so we started dating uh, about two and a half years ago. And, okay. then, uh, and then I proposed to her and we got married. And, uh, but it was kind of yes. cool because we didn't have to, we didn't have to get to know one another, right? There was no, like, did. yeah, like, <laughs> what's your favorite color? Like none of that shit. And most importantly, she had seen the worst in me. She'd seen no. the best in me. Uh, and so she, she knew what she you. was getting into and I knew what yeah. I was getting into. And so it, it works. Yeah. And by the way, it makes it really easy to work together. Uh, because there's none of that. Uh, like if you're a husband, wife team, you know what I'm talking about. It's a very delicate you know. balance. Like, Hey, can you, can you give me that lens? Right. You might say something like that. And then you start getting into these debates where I don't like the way you said that. Okay. I don't, <laughs> I, I, I just asked you for the lens. Uh, please. Uh, you know what I mean? So there's none of that with us. <laughs> uh, and if you like my, 
my personality, my energy level. Yeah. Alyssa is the perfect perfect yin to my yang. I mean, we yeah. are, we don't take much serious. We joke around all the time. Yeah, I love uh, it. We love working together. We, you know, we love traveling the world together. Nice. And that's part of why I love working together is because I wouldn't want to be on international yeah. destinations, but she's at home and yeah. so yeah. it's really it's really cool. She's uh, she is without a doubt my rock. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I could be wrong. You got married in Italy, forward. didn't you? Well, no, we didn't. We got oh. married in Vegas. Unfortunately, uh, we had monster wedding plans. Uh, and we were going to have, we had a castle in France. Um, we were going to have about 40 people out there. It was like hot air balloon rides, uh, you know, wine tasting, all these activities for our guests, COVID hits. Um, they wouldn't even give us a refund on our money. I mean, I'm talking like five digits paid, no refund. They're like, no, you can still come. And we're like, what, what planet are you guys living on? Like, they're not even letting us into your country. Uh, so this went on. For a little while, me and Alyssa were like, you know what? I love you. You love me. We want to get married. So we we went to the desert of Vegas, mm -hmm. paid a planner, and we just set up a kind of wedding chapel in the mm -hmm. middle of the desert. Nice. Had 20, 30 of our closest friends with us had our wedding in the middle of the desert. COVID awesome. wedding. Way to do her. Way to do her. Exactly. You know, well, it sounds interesting. So I want to talk about you guys working together for a bit more. You guys were, she was working with you. You were five years into photography. Do you, did you notice a trend when she came into the picture that things started to really happen? And was the dynamics between the two of you, did that play a key role? Did, uh, did you learn and grow from her and her input and ex vice versa? Did she learn and grow from you? As uh, often happens. Well, in this case, it didn't. So this is this is an interesting question. I'm I'm glad she's not here listening to this. So hopefully. We'll never share now it with her. You, now, when you have her on the show, you have to ask her her perspective. On okay. This. But uh, Alyssa almost got fired. So she was probably oh. one of my worst employees. This is okay. a true story. One of my worst employees. No kidding. Uh, very very entitled. Uh, felt like she wasn't being paid good enough. She wasn't. You know, she was working too hard. Uh, mm -hmm. Her parents mm -hmm. hated me. Um, you know, thought I was just working their daughter super hard and, um, I was, mm -hmm. I was about to fire her, uh, cause she was dropping the ball on several right. things. Right. And uh, now we're not dating at this point. Right. Yeah. Uh, so she almost gets fired and I tell her, I go, you know what, why don't you take some personal time, get your head right, figure out if this is the place you want to be. Right. And, uh, at that time she actually went out to Seattle and, uh, interviewed with creative live. Uh, of all companies. <laughs> yeah. Interviews with creative live. She spends like, I don't know, a few days out there. I don't remember how many days, not relevant. And, um, whatever happened, she comes back a completely new person. And like I said, have her, when she's on, I want you to ask her for her perspective on this. Yeah. Page. Because yeah. As she, as she likes to tell the story. She, she came back and realized, uh, she had an epiphany. If I want success, I got to work harder than anybody else is willing to work. If I want yeah. more money, I have to yeah. be willing to make sacrifices. And when she came back, I shit you not, her mindset changed and she became one of our top employees huh. um, because it was a mind shift change. It wasn't anything else. She didn't get smarter overnight. She didn't, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. get different work ethic. She just changed her perspective wow. and realized success is not guaranteed, yeah. right? You're, you're not guaranteed success. You're guaranteed the the pursuit, you know, here, at least, you know, in the United States, our mindset, our mantra is the pursuit of happiness and yeah. all those kinds of things, but you're not guaranteed that stuff. You got to work for it. And when that happened, uh, everything changed, uh, you know, for her and for the business, of course, but it was at that point in time, mm -hmm. it took, you know, it wasn't like overnight, but over time she became my kind of right hand where yeah, okay. anything that was major going on in the business, mm -hmm. I was handing it off to her. Because I knew mm -hmm. I could trust her to do it. Cool. And wow, that that's, that's true a, today. That's an amazing. The, one of the worst employees that's almost getting fired to now one of the bosses. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, she's my boss. I mean, yeah. I got to check to make sure my name's still up front. Sal, so, <laughs> so can you attribute the fact that you may have planted those seeds in her when she was in that initial phase before she almost got fired where, where she sort of heard it from you? It hadn't quite burst through the soil, so to speak, and become a reality, part of the epiphany. Because uh, I'm sure you have sort of been this way all your life, and you had this philosophy, and it comes through in your conversation. And a lot of the principles that you just talked about that she became aware of during this epiphany, 
do you think that somehow, some way, subconsciously or otherwise, that she got the message from you and her original, her uh, the original time she worked with you? I think that's fair. I think success, just like failure, is contagious. Um, mm -hmm. And I think when you're around more successful people, it challenges you to rise to that level. This yeah. isn't just at my business. This was. I would say this was true of when I was in corporate America uh, as well. I didn't want to be, who wants to be low man on the totem pole? Who takes a job and they're like, you know what? I aspire to be the worst person here, right? Like nobody, <laughs> nobody wakes up and they're like, I want to be the shittiest employee at a company, right? So yeah. if, if you've got leadership and people around you who are challenging you to be a, be a better person, be a better employee, be better at your craft, you're always going to rise, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're surrounded by just laziness, apathy, uh, good enough, that's that's cancer. This mindset yeah. of it's good enough, I find to be a cancerous mindset. Really, I would much rather have people. Now, there, it goes the other way, right? I mean, you could yep. over, um, what do they want to call it? What do you call it? Like um, over -analyze. analysis paralysis, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. you just you're trying to make something perfect, but like, dude, you're at ninety percent. It's time to move on, right? So mm -hmm. there's a healthy level there in the middle where it's like we got to get it to a bar that is of excellence uh, yeah. and realize it might not be perfect, but it is excellent. Let's move on to the next task, and that I think circles back to our culture here. Me as a person, it's the pursuit of excellence. I want to master my craft. I want to be good at what I do. Uh, I want to win, right? All those things I think bleed into our staff and our employees. At least I hope it does. I hope I impact them in a positive way. Sounds to me like it's working for you. I'm getting so many writer downers in t-shirts and blog post titles. Yes. <laughs> Success just like failure is contagious. I've never heard of that one before. And it's so true because it tells the other side of the story where failure is contagious. Mm -hmm. If we let that virus affect us, so we have to keep. But also, if you're afraid of failing, you're not going to move forward either. So you just got to do it, and you're going to fail. How many times did Trump fail, and then look, he becomes president of the United States? I mean, you're going to fail, but you learn from those. It's not just it's not just uh, being afraid of failure. It's it's a, I think this is actually a really good conversation. If you want to talk about just failure in general, failure is sure. an inevitability. You're going to fail at some point. I'm not saying you got to like it. I'm not saying you got to you got to look forward to it, but you just have to realize that every step you take forward is either one step closer to success or one step closer to failure. But the minute you get that failure out of the way, you can now take another step and learn from that, grow from that, move forward. Mm -hmm. The people who are paralyzed by the fear of failure, that's I think that's the difference between someone like myself or someone who's paralyzed by it. I understand I'm going to fail. I'm not going to like it. I'm not going to be happy about it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm going to I'm going to do everything in my power to be prepared for it. If that makes sense. Yep. Totally. Totally. I love it. These are good good conversations to have. This is the kind of stuff I like to hear about. I'm glad we're going down this road. Way more important than anything else, even marketing because it's the foundation that'll give anybody the fuel to move forward. So, but I got to ask you what was it about, like, I'm assuming you love doing weddings now, but what was it about the fact that you didn't like doing weddings at first? Uh, at the beginning, I felt like weddings were too restrictive. You know, my, uh, if you look at my portfolio of work, once I say mm -hmm. this to you, you're going to, you're, you'll never unsee it. I, I like architecture. Uh, and believe it or not, I fucking hate people. I'm not a people person uh, at all. Him and I, my wife would get along well. <laughs> no, I, nobody believes me when I tell it to him. I'm like, look, God, I don't believe really it. Sick joke. Yeah, he played the sick joke. He made me really good at being a communicator. Uh, but deep down inside, mine and Alyssa's happy place is like in our in our room under the blankets, watching a movie, uh, eating shitty food, takeout food. Like that's our mm -hmm. that's our happy place. But yeah. if you look at my site and you go to my portfolio, mm -hmm. you're going to notice big architecture. Yep, yep. Small, small bride, small subject. Yeah. And so what I figured out that now you're seeing the industry, all right, I'm not saying they're copying us, but you're seeing an industry more receptive to this style of photography. Mm -hmm. Rewind, rewind 12 years ago, no one was receptive to this. Now, I'm not no. saying clients, other photographers, right? Which who cares? They don't pay my bills. Other photographers were like, nope, what's that a picture of? Is that a picture of a canyon? Is that a picture of a, of a, a right, of Horseshoe Bend? And what they yeah. couldn't wrap their heads around is that, listen, numb nuts, I'm trying to sell this to my client. 
as a 30 by 40 print on their wall. All right. And, and when you are trying to sell a large print, people don't want to be bigger on their wall than they are in real life. Yeah. So from that perspective, it really allowed me to start selling architectural pieces uh-huh. with a little bride in it. And that's what I figured out 15 years ago. If nice. I want to make money in weddings, big money, and you know, average wedding spends 10 to 15 grand in our studio. Uh-huh. So if I want to make big money on a wedding, I got to find a way to differentiate myself from uh-huh. my competitors. And this was that way. This is All what right. I did. All right. So you had to push through that barrier that was there for you that you thought it was boring and limited. And this is the culmination of that evolutionary journey you took to. And it makes perfect sense. Uh, so you sell a lot of wall portraits of weddings. That's a big part of our business. Albums, at least the wedding side of the business, albums and large portraits. You know, we're mm-hmm. taking all the candid uh, journalistic style images throughout the day, the bride coming down the aisle, but you won't see that on my website, right? You'll right, see right. Okay. the type of images that I want to sell right. uh, because, you know, if a client's into photojournalism and they're looking for that moment of, you know, mom looking down the aisle crying and the crocodile tears coming down, yeah. hey, and that's an amazing moment. I've just never sold that as a 30 by 40 wall portrait to a right. client. So, yeah. and, and there's photojournalists out there. They are incredibly talented at mm-hmm. what they do. I don't pretend to even be that, right? Mine is more, mm-hmm. I would say cinematic is my, is my style. Yeah, that's a good term. So you've set this value, this baseline that you want to pursue, and that is the thing that is going to be where you, uh, well, obviously you're going to get a lot of pleasure from it because that's, that's what, what I enjoy. I yeah, and and uh, and the end result too is the sale, and you know I would have thought it's kind of interesting you're saying all this stuff because I grew up in the '80s. I started doing weddings in '82, and uh, the '80s the big trend was what you described the architectural photography. Then it went away in the '90s. The Dennis Reggie and the photojournalism, and then digital took over photojournalism, and then the spray and pray kind of concept came into yep. play, but. <laughs> Nobody was selling wall portraits anymore, mm-hmm. but I think, I think I stand corrected on that one. And uh, well, found- it, it, you're you're talking about you know this is the conundrum for all photographers. You talk to a photographer who's struggling, they will say clients don't want to spend money; they just want digital files. Yeah. You talk to a photographer that's thriving, and they're going to tell you all about how they're selling product. Mm-hmm. So. The two don't work together. I got news for you. You can only sell digital files for so much money, right? I can't, uh-huh. I can't sell digital files for 10 grand. Um, so you've got to find a way to differentiate your photography. Now, look, your audience may be watching and they may be saying his pictures suck. Okay, that's totally cool. I'm not offended by it. Um, maybe your pictures suck. So the thing is that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So what you should be working on as a photographer is not worrying about what another photographer is doing not worrying about how much money they're charging, uh, really focus on your house and focus on how you can add value to your potential clients. Now that's tough. That's a tough pill to swallow sometimes because then you start realizing that when people say no to you, they're actually saying no to you. Right. And that's, that's tough as creatives. We don't, you know, our feelings get hurt. We don't want to hear that kind of shit. But my mindset was if I'm going to, if I'm going to fail or succeed, it's going to be based on a clear vision. And 15 years ago, my clear vision was architecturally heavy images that are Hollywood worthy. That when my client walks into their home, there's going to be a picture on the wall that somebody's going to look at and go, oh, that's a beautiful picture of a church. Oh, oh, wow, you're in it. That was what I was going for, <laughs> right? And I've been, I've been riding that wave for 15 years now. And still mm-hmm. to this day, we get clients who come to us and they, they will tell us, Sal, I don't care what else you do in this wedding. I want that picture for my living room uh, really? when people come mm-hmm. over, right? Yeah. And so we've done really good at finding our niche. And mm-hmm. that is a testament to brand building, to marketing, and mm-hmm. to understanding the product or service you sell. That's amazing. It brings That's me amazing. to your staff idea, like when you go to a wedding and you have your assistant or assistants with you. Like I know there's a guy out of California. I think his last name's Busick, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, who is Joe similar Busick. to your yeah Joe Busick. And he, I remember seeing a special of his where he was like you. I don't do the photojournalistic. I'm like 
I'm going to get this moment, that moment. If a client comes to me or the parent at the wedding and says, can you come capture these family portraits or capture this? He's like, nope, my assistant there, I'll send them over. He he gets them to do all the grunt work. He does right. the stuff like you. He wants that main, those pictures are going to be blown up large. Are you on your wedding day similar where you're doing the stuff like the stuff we were just showing on your website there, like that kind of stuff, but leaving your assistants to do the run-of-the-mill photojournalistic type of stuff on that day you hit the nail on the head john when and my second shooter is Alyssa. yeah so now in my second shooter i've got somebody who's been working with me for 10 years i mean she knows mm -hmm. what i'm about to do before i do it right mm -hmm. and so if you bring my website back up and we just go back through we can pick any wedding portfolio image i'll give you guys perspective of what we're doing she's when we get into a room with a bride and groom right and the bride's getting ready i'm directing right Alyssa. yeah hold this one this this okay. is fine so on a on a wedding day right what's happening in a moment like this in a moment like this the bridal party's off to the left right they're drinking they're having a good time they're goofing around Alyssa is picking off those pj shots right and right. we have very clear dialogue when we're, when we're talking I, i'll be like hey you're in PJ mode. Nobody knows what that means, right? We know what it means, photojournalistic. Yeah, so yeah. she's looking for those candid moments. Me, I'm obsessing over the details here, whether it's their hand placement, the way the dress is laid, laying, uh -huh. the lighting. Uh, this is what uh, the, the, the frame up of the shot, right? I'm obsessing about this while she's picking off PJ so that when the client comes in to see their, their work, you know, in two weeks after their wedding, they're not like, oh, I wish you would have gotten this. I wish you would have gotten that. Don't worry about it. We we got all those shots. Yep. All I'm focused on is that iconic shot. Mm -hmm. um, go to go to go left or right a few a few frames here. Okay. Go one more. One more. You just tell me when to stop. Yeah, keep going. I love showing these. Keep going. Yeah, here, mm -hmm. perfect. Okay, I'll go back. So, this one, this is in Japan, right? And so we're here uh, in Japan uh, at a very architecturally beautiful church. And I, I just felt like there was a story here that was more, you can't, this is not photojournalism, right? And I'm not, please, let's be clear. I am not bashing photojournalism even a little bit. I think photojournalists are incredibly talented and I'm gonna add a word, patient. I have no patience. I see a shot I want, I'm gonna get that shot. I don't have time to wait and hope for somebody to walk by like street photographers. I'm like, I'd be hiring people. I'd be like, here's 20, do this. Um, <laughs> and so, but a shot like this, I felt like there was a story there to be told. Um, so we had one door left open. We had her acting like she was walking to the door, like as if she was getting ready to walk in for her wedding day. And we grabbed that veil. This is not Photoshopped, right? Grab that veil and held it to let the wind catch it. The wind happened to be blowing. Uh, that direction. So the wind in the veil matches the direction of her, her hair, the matches the direction of the dress and the doors open. This to me is an iconic type of shot that a client, my client is going to put on their wall, 30, 40, 40, 40 uh, in size because it's once in a lifetime shot. This isn't a, you know, grin and grab type of shot where she's standing there with her girlfriends. Those are important shots. People want them but they're not blowing those up on the wall. Does that make, make sense how we've carved our niche? Yeah. Definitely. That's cool. That's really, really cool. I got to ask you a question about that. When clients come into your uh, studio, said earlier, sometimes they'll come up and look at the wall and go, I want that shot. So obviously they're pre-sold on that idea that they're going to get a large wall portrait. So uh, you only show what you want to sell. And I'm assuming it's the same thing in your studio, your reception area. You got large prints that that's right. Reflect that. So how many people come in and to what degree do you think? I know it's hard to analyze and or measure, but the clients that come in and they have that idea in their mind that this is your style and this is where we're going as far as they're expect you're expecting them to buy a wall portrait. I mean, that's right. just the bottom line. And do they know that to some degree? You know, I don't know if you know Maria Sampaio. She's been around and we've done many. She's like this amazing sales lady. She's flat out tells them square to their face, this is what you're going to buy and mm -hmm. this is what you're going to spend. If it doesn't exactly suit what, you, that's fine. Yeah, what, that's exactly what, what we do. We tell okay. them, we're a little bit different, right? I'm not going to be like, hey, you're going to spend this much money. We say, though, like, here's what to expect, right? And I think mm -hmm. that's very important with your clients to have that kind of level set of, you know, what's normal. Uh, because they don't know what's normal. And if you leave it to your clients to read a, uh, 
I mean, the wedding blogs out there are disastrous for fucking people. Like, you yeah. know, they'll be like, you know, like the Knot or Wedding Wire or any of those blogs. They're very, in many cases, I feel like they're anti-photographer uh, with some of the information they put out there. It's just not really. It's not complete. Really? So, yeah, they, they they'll tell they'll tell clients that they should expect X Y Z, right? And that's well, that's not necessarily true, right? We're not mm -hmm. going to retouch every image okay. of a bride that she doesn't buy or put in her album, right? Like, so right. if I take 1,200 images and the bride wants her, her arm nudged in a little bit, right? Maybe she, she didn't, her wedding diet wasn't what she had hoped it would be. <laughs> and, and we want some body shaping to go on. Like, I'm not body shaping 1,200 images for you yeah. post-wedding, right? So there's just some things that get out there that it's better off you level set up front versus your client assumes anything. Mm -hmm. And so when a client comes into our studio, I tell them point blank, you don't have to buy anything after your wedding, but you will. And here's why you will. And All then right. I walk them through and I explain it to them. So right. there really is no pressure for them no. to buy. The pressure becomes if you did your job and you created those epic images, right. they can't they can't resist. And that that's the art of it all, isn't it? There's art in sales and there's art in photography. Yeah. Yeah, I like the way you said that. That's a beautiful way to convey the message that uh, you don't have to buy anything, but you will, and here's why. And that right. now opens the door, and they're going to be all ears, I would imagine. Yep. So do you sell the idea of beautiful uh, decor in their homes and capturing those memories and uh, using the iconic photo uh, concept, which is such a dynamic thing? It is. It's, we've built a career on it, you know, and yeah. – um, and hopefully we've inspired other photographers to be more than just digital delivery mechanisms, you know, and uh, <laughs> I, I hope, you know, I look back over my 15 year career, I hope we've inspired photographers to want more, to aspire for more, to not want to be starving artists. There's nothing, there is nothing even remotely appealing to me about yeah. being a starving artist. And I make no apologies for it. I, I want nice things. I like Mercedes. I like Louis Vuitton. Um, insert brand right i mm -hmm. yeah. i like these things i'm not going to apologize for wanting them yeah. that's 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 nuts go yeah. out there guys and and work your asses off and and mm -hmm. get aspire for more want more out of life do you use the same sales pitches or philosophy with your senior photography too or do you change it yeah. up a little bit no there's really no change the we find that our Senior clients, uh, after you've been doing this 15 years now, your senior clients are becoming your brides um, and your your families are with kids are becoming your seniors. So we, we try to make sure that we operate <laughs> operate in a very genuine way um, where we're being completely transparent with our clients so that they know whether they come to us for families or seniors or weddings, they know what they're getting into. And yeah. so we keep it. It's very similar to the sales process. Products might change, but the process yeah. is the same. This is really good. Definitely. All right, we got about eleven more minutes. So I'm gonna go into some quirky questions. Um, all right, where do I go? I've got so many because uh, you got so many things, and I love your philosophy. By the way, the F count is up to three, so you've got the all-time okay. record of three. No one's ever done that before. <laughs> I love it. That's embarrassing <laughs> that no one's gone over three. I mean, no one, know. no one's ever done one. I mean, it's oh. just. Like, it's taboo. You broke the taboo. You broke the seal. I love so. it. Breaking Good. barriers, guys. Every it is day. no BS. No where we go. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So, uh, so I got to ask you quickly. What? Who was your? Do you have any mentors? Who was your favorite mentor? Uh, no mentors. You know, there were people I looked up to when I was coming up. Uh, I stayed away from. Um, I I still to this day try to stay away from looking at other photographers. Not mm -hmm. because they're not good. Uh, I find like it kind of gets into my psyche a little bit. I don't, yeah. I don't care what anybody else is doing. So I really use um, Hollywood uh, for inspiration. You know, I love looking okay. at, you know, iconic movies and, and stuff like that. Um, but coming up, when I first came into the industry, uh, I don't I don't know if you guys will know him. Yervant, do you know that name? Oh, yeah. Saw him I, live in Toronto. Yeah. I, 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 loved, I loved his view of the world. So Yervant very much inspired me. Uh, with his view on the world and um, and even back then his editing style was very very unique I would say by today's standards. It's probably a little more heavy-handed mm -hmm. uh, But it was it was inspiring, you know, yeah. and I looked at somebody like him and I'm like this guy loves his craft He's yeah. good at what he does and he loves sharing knowledge with people and so mm -hmm. early on he was uh, he was a huge inspiration for me Cool. What about uh, your favorite movie since you mentioned Hollywood? And it's a question I often ask anyways yeah, I would say 
Marvel everything. Okay. <laughs> That's because he's like a superhero of photography, so why not go for the superheroes I guess, yeah. on Hollywood? <laughs> Who's your favorite superhero then? I mean, they're all iconic stories that uh, mm. are timeless. Tony and, Stark. Tony Stark nice. all day long. The, uh, the, that kind of works. Like sarcasm. Man. I fit yeah. right in with him. <laughs> <laughs> I fear for a lot of these movies, they seem to be going a lot of woke and uh, the stories are being lost, but uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. Well, Sal's well, also I mean, a very good cook too because all the time you see him on his Facebook and his Instagram, he's out in the kitchen, he's cooking Alyssa dinner and mm -hmm. that's right true. in there like a chef. If, uh, and wine I would say and... if that's the real question, what would I be doing if I weren't a photographer? I would say I'd be a chef at this point. That is nice. uh, that is an absolute passion. We've been to uh, Italy and gotten cooking lessons from mm -hmm. uh, chefs you know, out there and cool. uh, it's, been, it's been fun. I love cooking. Cool. Me too. What's your favorite meal? Anything pasta. Okay. See, I'm a meat guy. I love steaks and anything cooked on fire. Um, interesting. So if you had $100 million or a $1 billion, what would you do with it right now? Try and turn it into $2 billion. <laughs> Good answer. Short and sweet. That's <laughs> all I'd be doing, man. You know, I've, uh, I would say, you know, we've been Inc. 5000. Uh, in the United States, we have, uh, you know, there's like Inc. Magazine, Inc. 5000. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been uh, fastest growing company. We were on it three years in a row. Nice. Uh, and so you've got to have, you know, and to be there, you've got to have uh, certified accountant records and tax right. returns. And, and so that was kind of cool to be in the photo industry, you know, and you're on this list uh, of, of businesses. And so that's been really, really cool. I would say, and I only share that because that's how serious I take business. Uh -huh. um, and I view myself more as an entrepreneur uh, than I do a photographer. Like today, yeah. we've taken the revenue. We own a ton of real estate. Uh, we're about to break ground on building seven new homes that we're selling. So we've right. kind of gotten into real estate development, uh, yeah. you know, and some other retail um, items that we're working on. So yeah. I don't know. I love the art of being an entrepreneur. Uh, I hear you. It's obvious. And so those are, right, I'm, I don't want to say side gigs, but those are other projects that you're passionate about and you've got the time and effort to put into them. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. the same thing, right? Because those side yeah. projects require what? Photography, yeah. website, video production, all the things that throughout my career we've been building on and everything has led to the next iteration. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, what is a belief that you hold dearly that a lot of people or most people would kind of say, that's insane? Hmm. That's crazy. I hold that is, well, I believe, let's see this. I believe that the uh, media in the United States is one of the most cancerous items to our sanity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know that I'd be alone in feeling that. Uh, but I'm 100% with you, by the way. Yeah, yeah I think we're in the, we'd be in the minority. I yeah. think that's a problem going on around the world right now is that yeah. people are forgetting how to think on their own. Um, right. Yeah. You can't you can't just blame the media you can't blame any one person it's like yeah. you can't pull the wool over my eyes if i don't let you pull the wool over my eyes so it's kind of right. a dark time right now yeah that's interesting you say that because it really aligns with me i've said it years ago i said the mainstream media is to the truth what mcdonald's is to nutrition <laughs> that's a good, good analogy we're being fed junk food rob Oh, it's insane when people believe it. So, but unfortunately, um, for a lot of people, it tastes so good. That's the problem. <laughs> it tastes good, and then it yeah. fires off those dopamine <laughs> rockets. So, um, you're you said you're Italian and Middle Eastern. Would that be Lebanese or Syrian? Yeah, very good. Lebanese specifically. Yeah. So, what I like I, to say is, one side of my family will shoot you; the other side will blow you up. You take your <laughs> <laughs> but you make get great euros. We yeah. are fiery people, man. Either side of the uh, equation, mm -hmm. we are fiery. I think Steve Jobs was, uh, he was an adopted child, and I think he was of Lebanese descent, I think, or Syrian or something oh, like really? that. Oh, really? I never heard that. I wonder yeah. if that's true. It is. What's well, in his book. Oh. Yeah, he was adopted. His parents who grew, raised him, uh, they were not his biological parents, and his real parents were of Middle Eastern descent. But uh, I, met a, I know a lot of them in my city, and they're all like, such solid people like you know abbas john i mean the yep. guy's the guy's top amazing it's who we use for our wedding album. well it's in, you know it's interesting i was over in uh i was over in ireland and uh 
I ran into somebody in, in uh, we, you know, we get, you know, you get around people, you're talking politics, you're talking religion, you're talking race. You, you, you know, I, I love those, those discussions, by the way, I think they are, they're fun. They're fun. Mm-hmm. They get, they get mm-hmm. a little heated, but at the end of the day, you're, you're hugging and you're, you know, you're, you're finding the middle ground. And I think more people yep. are in the middle of any, any discussion. We're all closer to the middle than we are on the edges. Right. So mm-hmm. there's always the lunatics that are on either edge. And then I would say 90%, 80% of us are in the middle somewhere. So I'm over in Ireland and we're having this conversation uh, about like kind of welfare programs and, um, you know, are they helping people or hurting people? And in Ireland, I don't know if this is still true, uh, but they had explained to me like, yeah, there's there's public assistance in Ireland. But if you if you're down on your luck, they're going to give you a, uh, a check, but you're going to have to work cleaning streets. Right. So they won't just give you money. You're going to work. And and the reason for that is because they're a proud culture and they mm-hmm. don't want they don't want handouts. And I think, you know, when I look back at my grandparents and, and my parents, I think being of and coming from an immigrant family uh, mm-hmm. and get, we're hustlers, right? We're going to yeah. work hard. We don't want to be right. Remember what I said earlier on this broadcast, I want to be the worst employee. There is no, we, uh, we aspire, we don't want handouts. Uh, we just want a chance, you know? And I would say if you talk to many Italians or middle Easterners, they mm-hmm. probably feel that way. Just give us a chance. Let us mm-hmm. prove ourselves. Let us work hard. Uh, we don't want handouts. We just want guidance, assistance, right? If that if that makes any sense, where I'm going yeah. with that, and I and I think that should explain a lot about me. I'm super competitive. Uh, I want to win, but I'm also compassionate. I want to raise the level of the people around me. I want to I want to mm-hmm. raise the bar for what it means to be a photographer, uh, mm-hmm. and 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 raise those standards, if you will. So, but it's mm-hmm. you know maybe it's tough love sometimes, but I really do believe in hard work, no bullshit, which is why I love this uh, mm-hmm. podcast. And really mm. pushing yourself to be a better person. Yeah. Cool. That's amazing. I love it. Yeah. So so you're a character in a Godfather movie. <laughs> Which one are you? <laughs> Ooh, gosh, I don't know. So <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I'm Don. I don't think I'm uh I don't think I'm the Don. I think I think I'm uh kind of Al Pacino. I think I'm kinda <laughs> That's that's my character there. Before he became Don, I can't that's believe right. I asked. I can't believe I asked that question. I don't know why I thought of it. What's the that's worst? Okay. My like... family's English, and I'm part Irish and Scottish. So that Irish yeah. and Scottish fights with each other all the time. Oh I yeah, drink, you guys, but are, I hate you guys myself. are feisty too, man. Yeah, I can drink, but I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the last question for you, Sal? Um, you're 51. If you could go back in time, and what would you tell 24 year old Sal? Oh. Man, if I ran into 24-year-old Sal, I'd say get <laughs> get your shit together. Um, uh, you know, I was a late bloomer, guys. I um, yep. I got kicked out of uh, – we'll have to save this for another podcast. I got kicked out of four high schools in two years. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate. We only have one minute left, and we just don't have enough time to, to, to cover that, that topic. So yeah. you're saved by the bell. Back. Yeah. I got kicked out of one, but you four – in That's, two years, my friend. In two years. Man. So you were lively. I was a uh, no drugs, no uh, no alcohol. It was all all fist fights. That's right. That was uh, I was I was fiery. I told you. Fight club. Yeah. You're a scrapper. Yeah. yeah, I got I still. I have scars all over here. And yeah, so, why uh, why yeah. were you such an angry young man? I really don't know. Like I had such a bright future ahead of me. Why was I so angry? Well, you had a chip on your shoulder, or uh, was it uh, a competitive thing with other guys, alpha male thing? Uh, no, you know, it, it's funny. Like, I never um, – I'll tell you one story. We'll end it here. Okay. And this is a true sure. story. You're going to be like, it, it sounds like it's bullshit. It's not bullshit. I believe uh, you. One of the high schools I got kicked out of was uh, in uh, New Jersey. Uh, at the time, my mom had sent me – my last high school was a military school because uh, they were like, we got to get this kid under control. Uh, probably the best thing that could have ever happened. The right. school said – there's nothing wrong with your son. He's a, uh, he's, he's bored. And uh, <laughs> that's what they, that's what they realized. So they, so what they do, I was, you know, 16 years old and they're giving me responsibility to keep me from getting into trouble. And it worked. It was, it was brilliant, but true story. Um, I'm in uh, school in Jersey and uh, I had this friend and we'd walk from, it's a, it's a movie. We'd walk from class to class and you'd get into the intersection where all the classes kind of funnel into each other to the different mm-hmm. wings. And these kids, would knock his books out of his hand every single day. And every day I would help him pick them up. And I would say to him, right, because I, I grew up in New York City. I'm a, I'm a Brooklyn boy. 
Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my family, like, you got to fight for yourself. You got to defend yourself. If you don't, they're going to keep bothering you. And, uh, and, uh, I was, uh, I, I was 16 at the time and, um, and they're knocking his books on. I'm like, you've got to, you've got to say something. He's like, it's okay. It's okay. It, it'll stop. You know, he just didn't want to get into trouble. He's just a really shy, uh, timid kid. And they just kept running their mouth. And this one day I was not in the mood and I grabbed his history book. And I knocked one of them unconscious, hitting them across the head with his history book. This is a God's honest, true story. Uh, knocked him unconscious uh, with that. Wow. And then, you know, of course, the 16 year old kid just knocked out uh, a, a senior and uh, with a history book. So it wasn't I wasn't going to last long in that uh, inner city school. So I, uh, yeah. I was I was removed. Amazing. And that's yeah. So. That happened over. You said you were a late bloomer, and uh, that's good. Well, I'm I was glad just always you... getting in trouble, right? I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. stay on task, uh, and it wasn't until I got, it wasn't until I got out of college that I finally figured out, like, okay, you're 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 an adult. You've got to uh, you got to start planning for your future and uh, and thinking about your career, and mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to be a kid anymore. And and that's when I started getting my life together. Uh, or focused, I should say, not together, more, more focused. I just wish I would have figured that out a little bit younger. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us, you know, and I've heard you say uh, on another podcast, so you've heard it here, folks. We're going to get Sal back in about six months. We'll hit you up again see if we can get you back on one of these. <laughs> well, I started in, what, September to get him, and we got him in there, so yeah, he's a busy yeah. man. Well, I don't so. know. you got my wife in here now, so who knows what's going to end up happening. True. We'll We're get hear you both in together, maybe. We're going to hear the other side of the story. That'll be an That's amazing right. podcast. Really looking forward to it. And I really appreciate you coming on board and uh, sharing this. Uh, it was uh, an hour of pure gold and wisdom and philosophy that uh, anybody, uh, if you're not tuned into this, man, this is it. This is mm -hmm. where it's at. It's all there. So no, I appreciate it. You guys are too kind. I this was awesome. And, and for all the photographers watching, guys, get out there. Make your own mark. Chase your dreams. Don't let anyone tell you it's not possible. You can be whatever you want to be uh, no matter what. So uh, God bless. Get out there and kick some ass. All right. Definitely. We'll end it Excellent. on that note. Thank you very much. Talk to you guys Thank later. You. Take care. Thanks, guys.